Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Good afternoon. My name is Father Michael Marcantone. I'm a priest of the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Detroit. I want to thank you for tuning back into our channel and checking out our latest videos. Uh, if you do like what you find here, please remember to like and subscribe and share this content so that we can get it out to as many as possible. It just takes a second. So hit that subscribe button now while it's still fresh in your mind and please share this out. Uh, so, I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about worship in general, because we do some things in the Orthodox Church that are somewhat peculiar to our neighbors, and the way that we approach worship to God is more than a little bit different. Now, as I've mentioned in a previous video, worship within Orthodoxy is not anthropocentric, meaning it does not center on the worshiper. While we could expect that because we're coming in contact with the Most High God, our Heavenly Father who loves us, we will receive some kind of benefit. We will receive the benefit of, uh, of peace, of tranquility. Our minds and our souls will be edified. We, we can be sure of that, but that's not why we're there. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we approach the Divine Liturgy or when we approach Orthodox worship, if we come in with the mentality of how can I be comforted and how can I be fed, we are more often than not going to leave disappointed. And it's not because the Orthodox services are not beautiful. They are. And it's not because the Orthodox services are not edifying. They absolutely are if you're engaged. But what's going to make the difference is whether or not the tool is doing what you expect it to do, or, or, or let's put it another way, whether or not our expectations are properly calibrated to the subject matter we're talking about. So when we're talking about Orthodox worship, the subject matter isn't your education, and the subject matter isn't your comfort. The subject matter isn't feeding you. The subject matter, the, the topic, is properly worshiping the God who created us and giving him thanks for what he's done for us, and through that worship, entering into communion with him. Worship has this peculiar function of bringing us into union with something else. It has this peculiar function of taking us out of ourselves and allowing us to commune with a reality beyond ourselves, and in this case, a reality beyond the merely human. Transcendent beauty always has that sort of property. And that's really what we see. Like when we see anything that's awe-inspiring, it takes on a transcendent quality. Whether we're looking at uh, whether we're looking at a gorgeous sunset, a beautiful landscape, whether we see some of the architectural marvels that exist across the world, they have the effect of removing us out of ourselves, but they also bring us into communion. So if we, if we go, let's say, for example, I lived in central California uh, for about a year and a half during my early adulthood when I was about 20 years old. And I used to love to go out to Big Sur, which is one of the most breathtaking landscapes in, uh, in North America. There, there's these mountains and ravines and the ocean is there and cliffs. It's gorgeous. And if you go there and you spend time there and you take in the beauty, you start to feel a certain connection. And you start to feel a kinship and a communion with the place. It becomes intimate to you. Uh, this is why people at our churches, for example, they get so very attached to the architecture of the church. You don't move the pews or you don't take out uh, a, a commemorative stained glass window. Even if it should come out, you don't take it out because people have built a relationship with the environment that they're in and they feel close to it, for better or for worse. And worship has that quality. It moves us into communion with something beyond ourselves. Now, the first and primary mode of worship within Orthodoxy. You know, so it's distinct from prayer services, right? So the first and primary 
form of worship within Orthodoxy is the Holy Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ, where, where as we say in the liturgy, we offer these gifts from your own gifts on behalf of all and for all. Tasa ektonson, si prosferomen. So why do we offer these gifts from your own gifts? Well, because they're not ours. We can't create anything. Everything that exists is his. It belongs to him, but we offer it back to him. And as human beings, we offer it back changed and transformed. We don't give him back the wheat that he gave us. We give him back bread. We don't give him back the grapes. We give him back wine. It's still his from his. It's still being offered, offered on behalf of all and for all. We make sure to, to mention that it's, it doesn't come from us it comes from him but nevertheless our hands has touched it our hands our our, our hands have uh, transformed it and now we're offering back to god the fruit of our labor which is more than we, we received but nothing that we could do on our own and that is of its essence of a priestly act and that is the supremely human achievement whether we like it or not everything that we come into contact with is changed and altered and we offer it back to god as St. Peter's epistle says, uh, on that day, the day in which the Lord appears, the, each man will stand before him with the works that he has done, and they will be tried. And if his works survive, he will receive a reward. And if not, he will suffer loss. So we offer back to God the unbloody sacrifice of the Eucharist as he commanded at the Last Supper. We offer him bread and wine as he commanded, as he did, not on our own initiative, but on his invitation. But the property of worship is offering. So there is one other type of offering made within the church, and that is incense. And so when the priest, and so when the priest offers incense in the services, he blesses the incense and says, We offer your incense as an offering of spiritual fragrances, O Christ our God. As you receive it at your celestial altar, send down to us in return the grace of your all Holy Spirit. Now, unless you think that the offering of incense is some sort of uniquely Christian invention, Remember that it comes from Psalm 140, 141, where it says, Like incense, let my prayers rise before thee, O Lord. Let the lifting up of my hands be the evening sacrifice. The Mosaic law included incense offerings. And indeed, when we read through 2 Kings and we see the description of Solomon's temple, the cloud of incense smoke in the temple was so thick that they couldn't see. And it's not just here in this world. Into eternity, into the kingdom, incense is a symbol of the prayers of the faithful rising before God. And so when we turn to the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of John, at the very end of the Bible, we see a fascinating scene. We see the, elder, the martyred elders of God underneath his throne, imploring him about what is happening to their brothers on the earth. So note there, they're aware of what's happening and they're talking to God about what's happening. They receive an answer. In their case, the answer is no, but they talk to God. They intercede with God about what's happening on the earth. That's in the Bible. It's in Revelation. And then an angel, an angel of the Lord comes with a smoking bowl of incense containing the prayers of the faithful and offers it before the throne of God the Father. So even in the Old Testament, even in this vision of eternity, incense is connected with offering the prayers of the faithful before God the Father. And why then would one servant offer, why would an angel be offering the prayers of the faithful? Well, I mean, this is what God invites us to do. See, we, we have this terrible tendency, this, this, uh, reductionist tendency within our world where we want to say, isn't this enough? Well, God doesn't think in terms of enough. He loves us. He loves his creation. He loves his angels, but he loves human beings as his image and likeness. He doesn't need any of us, but he loves us and wants us. And then because he desires it, invites us to share in his divine work and to share in his governance of the universe.
And so as St. Paul says, we are entreated to pray for one another, to offer supplications for one another, to lift up every circumstance with thanksgiving. That's Eucharistia, the Eucharist, right? Even the angels present our prayers before God. And remember what Jesus says about the angels. Jesus says, Woe to you who causes one of these little ones to stumble, for their angels stand ever, always before the throne of my Father. Again, this is not something the church makes up. This is from Scripture. This is from the words of Christ. Because God in His love and generosity chooses to allow His governance to be shared, to be participated in. It's His but we get to participate simply because he loves us. And so in nearly every service of the Orthodox Church, I can only think of one or two exceptions, there is some quantity of incense offered. The prayers of the saints rise before God. The lifting of their hands is the evening sacrifice. Incense also has the, uh, incense also has the property of sanctifying, of purifying. We're marking a we're marking apart this space as sacred, as special, as belonging to God. And like every other act of worship, it involves communion. You see, in the Eucharist, communion is fairly straightforward. The Holy Spirit descends, the bread and wine is changed into the body and blood of Christ. We consume Him and He enters us. But in incense, we offer Christ incense as an offering of spiritual fragrance. We ask him to send down to us in return the grace of the all-holy spirit, but we also share in the offering. We can also smell it. We can also see it. Uh, I know a great many people find watching the burning of incense while they're prayer to be a very meditative exercise. We take part in that offering. We share in it. He shares with us. And that mode of communion tells you a lot about the God whom we serve. That he does not simply take for himself that which has been offered to him, but freely shares it with his children. That he doesn't need it, but we do need the communion with him, the building up of being reunited to him, and the purpose that comes from being his image and likeness. And so he shares it with us freely, without reserve, not because he has to, but because he wants to. So that is, a, uh, that is a little bit of a look at incense and worship within the context of Holy Orthodoxy. Most of our, most of our uh, heterodox Christian neighbors do not use worship, incense in worship. It's very few. I think the, uh, the Roman church also uses incense. I, I do not believe the Protestants do, but I'm welcome to be uh, corrected on that. So I know that it can be, seem strange when you, when you walk into a divine liturgy for the first time and you encounter the copious amounts of incense that you will encounter. But keep in mind that it's not just there to make smoke and it's not just there to give a fragrant ambiance. It's there because it allows our prayers to be, according to the scriptures, Part of the sacrifice that we offer and that we offer on behalf not only of ourselves, but for those around us. And as the incense rises before the throne of God, so our prayers also rise before him. And we don't offer those prayers alone. We offer them in communion with one another. In the unity of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. And that is at the heart of everything we do in worship. So when you go to church and you see the incense, you smell the incense, you observe what's happening with the incense. Don't look at it as a show. Don't look at it as something that's happening over there that the deacon and priest are doing. This is part and parcel of your worship, your offering, your prayers being offered together before the throne of God with minds and with everyone else there present. May the Holy Trinity bless and protect you always, and grant you a joyous nativity season. Christ is born. Glorified.